Yo, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Lost Angel of Havoc, a.k.a. Latato, the one and only high priest of the congregation. Welcome back to Latato Clips, where we've got a little bit of everything. And y'all, we are down to the final few days before the launch of the final shape. Now, in the last couple of weeks, Bungie has released a couple of Vidocs, as well as some Dev Insight articles, and of course, the weekly twids, going over some more changes that are coming in the final shape. Among the changes, existing subclasses will see some updates, as well as exotic armor and weapons. There's also the new Pathfinder system that was teased. We've got a good bit of ground to cover in this video, so let's get right into it. Before we get started, please be sure to give the video a thumbs up. It's a little bit, but it does go a long way in terms of helping the channel grow. And if you want to see more content like this, don't be afraid to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you can stay up to date with me and won't miss the next video. Now we'll start with what ability tuning will look like in the final shape. The combat gameplay team gave us a rundown of all the changes we can expect across the board. Now back in November, it was discussed that Bungie would be reevaluating where Well of Radiance and Ward of Dawn sat within the sandbox. Now that the final shape is upon us, they've worked on refining both supers in ways that will most closely align with their specific fantasies. Well of Radiance has always behaved as a powerful combination of the effects granted by healing and empowering rifts. However, currently the invulnerability and sheer damage boost it provides pretty much makes it the go-to option for most teams. I mean, I imagine we've all had those raid moments where we're loading up and the question is asked, hey, who's bringing the well lock, you know? Um, that being said, it was decided that going forward, more focus would be placed on Well's offensive benefits, such as granting players a Radiant buff while also dialing back its defense a bit. Going forward, Well of Radiance will now grant Radiant for eight seconds when players exit the Well of Radiance area. Player survivability has been reduced while standing in the Well of Radiance, and they've also increased the maximum orbs of power from defeating targets while in your Well of Radiance aura. Now, Ward of Dawn, otherwise known as Bubble, has always acted as a safe haven for fire teams. Unfortunately, with the way the gameplay loop exists currently, there isn't a whole lot of room for it to perform as well as other options. Therefore, the team has moved towards building up its defensive capabilities while limiting its offense. In the final shape, Ward of Dawn will now immediately apply a full void over shield to the caster and allies that enter its dome. Armor of Light will now grant additional damage resistance to players inside of the Ward of Dawn. Allies near the Ward of Dawn will now have a Void Overshield trickled on over time. Weapons of Light will no longer be provided by default, and this behavior has been moved to the benefits provided by the Helm of Saint-14. And the player that casts the Ward of Dawn can now generate additional orbs by defeating enemies with melee attacks inside of or near the Ward. In addition to this, due to the supers above, as well as other burst damage supers becoming increasingly more dominant within the Crucible, all supers will now use the same damage-based recharge mechanism in the final shape. While different supers will still vary in terms of passive recharge, dealing a specific amount of damage to a specific enemy type will result in the same amount of super energy gain no matter what super you currently have equipped. Next up, we'll be talking about individual subclass changes, starting with Stasis. After the release of Stasis, attention moved to the Bungie 30th Anniversary Pack and Void 3.0, which only left a limited amount of time for major updates to the suite. Since then, there's been a need to reevaluate Stasis in relation to the other damage types, as well as a desire to make some substantial changes. In the final shape, the Stasis Shard Overshield, which was previously a minor feature, will now be upgraded to a full-on keyword. This new keyword will be integrated into the abilities, armor, and weapon perks, enhancing the synergy and utility of Stasis in various builds and playstyles. These changes will allow for a more comprehensive and meaningful integration of Stasis Shards into to gameplay. Now this new keyword for stasis is frost armor, a stacking buff that reduces incoming damage and the damage reduction also increases as you gain more stacks of frost armor. Frost armor also remains active when you're casting your super though it's a little bit less effective. New behaviors have been added to all of the harvest aspects so while grim, tectonic, and glacial harvest is equipped, stasis shards will grant a small amount of health and a stack of frost armor and large stasis shards created from Grim Harvest specifically will grant more health and frost armor stacks. In addition to this, all harvest aspects will now have a standardized cooldown when a large number of shards are created very quickly. Now, in order to create even more variety in sources that grant frost armor, updates have been made to Renewal Grass and Valador's Wrath Weavers as well. 
Renewal Grass have had their generic damage resistance replaced with Frost Armor, so upon entering your Duskfield Grenade volume, you and your allies will gain a stack of Frost Armor, and every few moments while in the volume, an additional Frost Armor stack is granted as well, resetting your timer. Now with Balladorus Wrathweavers, They've had their Stasis Shard over Shield replaced with Frost Armor when you activate a Rift or use the Winter's Wrath Shatter Attack. With the introduction of Frost Armor, the team also looked into the existing pool of Stasis Fragments and made some changes based on base behavior of Stasis Shards and the potential synergies now available with the new keyword. Whisper of Rhyme has been reworked and no longer grants an overshield when picking up a Stasis Shard. Instead, it now increases the maximum duration and stack count of your Frost Armor. Whisper of Chains has also been reworked and will no longer grant a passive damage resistance when near a stasis crystal or frozen target. Instead, it will now grant a chance to create a stasis shard when defeating a target while you have one or more stacks of frost armor. Whisper of Fractures will now grant a stack of frost armor when you shatter any frozen target with a melee attack. Whisper of Torment's grenade energy gains are no longer dependent on your current health value. And the team has also created two new fragments to further promote the utility of stasis shards and frost armor, Whisper of Chill and Whisper of Reversal. With Whisper of Chill, stasis weapon final blows will have a chance to create a stasis shard. And with Whisper of Reversal, dealing or receiving physical melee, i.e. not projectile melee damage, will slow your victim or attacker while you have frost armor active. And while Stasis by Design has had a focus on high value crowd control, it hasn't necessarily hit that mark in the current sandbox. Shattered damage, unlike other subclass keywords, hasn't had the payout expected, so the team is implementing some changes to address this. Base shattered damage in PvE has been increased from 200 to 400. Bosses will no longer be hit with two instances of shattered damage when auto shattering, and players in an active super will no longer show immune damage flyouts when automatically breaking out of the stasis freeze. Now, as far as the changes to the individual classes, for Stasis Hunters, aka Revenants, changes have been made to Winter Shroud, Touch of Winter, and Silence and Squall in order to improve synergy with other abilities and effectiveness, whether you're in high difficulty PvE activities or you're just having a little bit of fun in PvP. For Winter Shroud, they added a new behavior, so slowing targets briefly increases your class ability regeneration rate, but this bonus has been reduced in PvP game modes. It also now grants PvE damage reduction when activated. With Touch of Winter, the Glacier Grenade has now added an additional stasis crystal to the ring formation, and the Glacier Grenade ring now forms over 0.27 seconds rather than instantly. The Cold Snap Grenade no longer chains an additional time while Touch of Winter is equipped, but instead, Seekers now duplicate when they freeze a target. Second and third Seeker chains now create a medium and large stasis crystal respectively, rather than every chain creating a small crystal. For Silence and Squall, Squall's maximum travel speed has been increased by 10%. Squall's Storm now slows down when any target is within its area of effect to reduce instances where it could overshoot its target. And the damage and slow tick rate versus PvE combatants has been increased by about 40%. Moving on, we have our Behemoths, our Stasis Titans. Several quality of life improvements are being made for Stasis Titans, such as making Shiver Strike and Glacial Quake more reliable, as well as enhancing the ease of use of Diamond Lances for better combat integration into Prismatic. For Shiver Strike, they've increased the damage versus PvE combatants by 10%, they've also increased the size of the melee target search area by about 50%, and they've also increased the maximum lunge tracking angular speed. Glacial Quake now automatically begins sprinting when the player throttles forward. The sprint time requirement for Cryoclasm has been removed, but it will now go on a cooldown for four seconds after one extended slide. And with Diamond Lance, the thrown detonation radius has been increased. The slam detonation radius against PvE combatants has been increased. Diamond Lance can also now shatter stasis crystals on direct impact. The pickup interaction time has been reduced, while the pickup interaction radius has been increased. And for my stasis wielding warlocks out there, my shade binders, you're in a relatively good place in the sandbox currently in relation to the other stasis subclasses, so there's been a very limited focus on yours. However, there's been a small change made to the ice flare bolts. They've increased the maximum number of seekers created before going on cooldown. Now we are moving on to the changes coming to arc. First up, we've got arc grenade changes. 
The Storm Grenade received a 20% damage increase versus PvE combatants, although there's been no changes to the variant provided by Touch of Thunder, while Skip and Arc Bolt Grenades received a 15% damage increase versus PvE combatants. There will also be some quality of life changes made to certain arc fragments as well. The ability regeneration bonus provided by Spark of Recharge now persists until the player returns to full shields. Spark of Beacons now also triggers on defeating targets with arc power ammo weapons while amplified. And Spark of Frequency now also grants 15 weapon stability on powered melee hits in addition to its reload benefit. Now moving on to the classes, Arc Hunters, aka my Arc Striders, generally perform well in mid-level PvE activities, but they struggle in higher difficulty content. While no major alterations are planned for the kit, Arc Striders do have a new super and aspect coming with the final shape, and the team plans on evaluating things further once those elements are live in the game. But for now, the focus has been on adding keyword utility to Arc Staff, enhancing disorienting blows uptime to make it more competitive with combination blow, and allowing Tempest Strike to now grant a brief period of PvE damage resistance, aiming to improve player survivability while using it. That said, for Arc Staff, the heavy palm strike attacks and heavy air slam will now blind enemies, disorienting blows base cooldown time has been decreased, and Tempest Strike now has additional damage resistance versus PvE combatants when activated, lingering for a short duration after the attack. There have been similar changes made for Arc Warlocks in order to improve survivability and effectiveness. For Lightning Surge, additional damage resistance has been added versus PvE combatants when activated, lingering for a short duration after the attack. For Ball Lightning, they've increased the final arming shape. They've also fixed an issue where their arming shape was offset upward, higher than the maximum damage range for the projectile's detonation. And for Chain Lightning, they've increased the secondary chain projectile's base damage. And for Arc Titans, aka my Strikers, they will also be seeing some adjustments, including enhancements to Thunderclap, a rework of Knockout, and adjustments to the Touch of Thunder. For Thunderclap, they've added additional damage resistance versus PvE combatants when activated, lingering for a short duration after the attack. They've also increased the minimum and maximum damage versus PvE combatants, as well as increasing the maximum damage versus enemy players. For Knockout, they've increased bonus damage granted to power melee attacks versus PvE combatants. They've also reworked the healing behavior for Knockout so it no longer unstuns health regeneration on melee defeats. It now instantly grants a chunk of healing that scales with the type of targets defeated. Now for Touch of Thunder, the Storm Grenade now has increased tracking travel speed when targeting PvE combatants, and the Lightning Grenade now applies Jolt after the first damage event rather than prior. Now moving on to the next subclass damage type, Solar. We have, in addition to the changes detailed earlier with Well of Radiance, Bungie is also making improvements to abilities being included with Prismatic as well as standalone abilities that they feel need some love. So we have some changes coming to the Swarm Grenade. They've increased the tracking shape size. They've also increased the linger duration and the damage versus PVE combatants. Now for Solar Hunters, changes have been made to both accommodate reworks of some abilities as well as some adjustments, <coughs> nerfs, uh, meant to benefit the overall health of the game long term. So with Lightweight Knife, it now has two melee charges by default. They've increased the throw animation speed. They've also reduced the suppression time between throws so both knives can be thrown very quickly back to back. Also, please note, the additional melee charge does not stack with Ophidius Bath due to the exotic's unique energy recharge behavior. The team is monitoring this and will reevaluate things once everything is live in the game. Anyway, moving on, Knock em Down's internal cooldown on the throwing knife refund has been reduced, and for Golden Gun Marksman, they've reduced the strength of orbs of power created on precision hits. For our Solar Titans, aka our Sunbreakers, the team had to take a look at Consecration and Hammer of Soul, which are both featured as part of Prismatic. The idea was to make changes to allow for these abilities to still be powerful without relying on aspects specifically tied to the Solar subclass. So, for Consecration, the Slam Attack can now shatter Stasis Crystals, and Ignitions created by Consecration now deal 20% additional damage to PvE combatants. They've also fixed an issue where Consecration's Slam Attack was sometimes unable to damage floating combatants while they were grounded. They've also fixed an issue where Consecration's intended PvE damage resistance was not being applied. For Hammer of Soul, they've increased the projectile submunition count when Soul Invictus is not equipped, and the Shrapnel submunitions now deal additional damage when Soul Invictus is not equipped. 
Now we'll be discussing void. Each class will be seeing some general adjustments and improvements for their respective void subclasses in the final shape. Void hunters are in a good place at the moment, especially with their popularity right now in Onslaught. But that said, changes are being made to help build up the kit's neutral game. For Snare Bomb, they've increased the linger duration of the smoke after detonation. It also now applies a small damage over time to enemies in the smoke, which increases in strength the longer they remain in it. Trapper's Ambush now also has an increased linger duration of smoke after the detonation. It also applies the same damage over time effect from the Snare Bomb, and they've also fixed an issue where the Trapper's Ambush smoke effects could be obstructed by the ground geometry. And Stylish Executioner's weaken effect can now be applied by Glaive Melee. Now, for my Void Walkers, aka my Void Warlocks, they will also see some improvements to their kit, with a focus seemingly to be effectiveness and how the abilities perform, especially those being featured in Prismatic. With Chaos Accelerant, the Charge Magnetic Grenade now has an increased maximum intensity of the Physics Knockback Impulse. It also does increased damage versus PvE combatants by 20%. Chaos Accelerant also now passively decreases your Magnetic Grenade's cooldown by 10%. Pocket Singularity has increased detonation damage versus PvE combatants by about 50%. And for Nova Bomb, the Cataclysm variant has an increased Seeker count. They also fixed an issue where Seekers could impact on the environment on creation. For the Vortex variant, they increased the Vortex Linger duration and fixed an issue where the Linger visual effects were shutting off early. And for Void Titans, there was a focus on improving the consistency for the Shield Throw melee, as well as a quality of life change for Offensive Bulwark. For Shield Throw, they've increased its maximum bounce count, increased its maximum lifetime, and they've also increased its tracking shape size and strength after each bounce, increasing its ability to consistently find a new target. They've also slightly increased the gravity and decreased the thrust speed with each bounce, and they've given it a 20% damage increase versus PvE targets. Offensive Bulwark can now only extend Void Overshield's timer to its normal maximum duration to prevent an issue where players could get into a bad timer state. It also now regenerates a small portion of your active Void Overshield with each melee defeat. Last but certainly not least in this review of subclass changes coming in the final shape, we have Strand. Now these incoming changes have been primarily focused on reining in the outliers at both the top and bottom end instead of larger reworks that the other subclasses have seen. The team will be watching how these changes affect the sandbox as we go into the final shape and we'll revisit them in the future once they have a chance to see how Strand behaves with Prismatic. First up we have changes coming to Threat of Warding. Threat of Warding is currently too potent, even overshadowing the Into the Fray aspect for Berserker Titans as the best source of woven mail for fire teams. Therefore, the following changes have been made. They've reduced woven mail duration on Orb of Power pickup from 10 seconds to 5 seconds. And while initially designed primarily as a traversal tool as part of the Widow's Silk aspect for Strand Hunters, Grapple Tangles have become something else entirely. Now, Grapple Tangles can be used to pull off an almost infinite amount of grapple melees, particularly on Strand Titans. To address this, the following changes have been made. Grapple Tangles no longer fully refresh their duration when grappled to, and now increase their duration by a maximum of 5 seconds per grapple, reducing to a maximum of 1 second added after 5 consecutive grapples to the same grapple tangle, and additionally, grapple melee will no longer be able to be used after firing your weapon. For my Strand Hunters, aka my Thread Runners, Ensnaring Slam's detonation volume versus enemy players is now a cylinder with a 6.5 meter radius rather than a sphere with an 8 meter radius. Threaded Spike has a very small damage reduction versus enemy players, and also catching your Threaded Spike no longer breaks invisibility, which is going to be crazy. For my Strand Locks, aka my Brood Weavers, Weaver's Call has added behavior, so defeating a target with strand damage now has a chance to generate a perch threadling with a higher chance of generation from defeating more powerful targets, and this damage can be from any source including other threadlings. And my strand titans, aka my berserkers, into the phrase melee energy regeneration scalar has been reduced in PvE activities, but remains unchanged in PvP. For Banner of War, the maximum timer has been reduced. Melee, Glaive Melee, and Super Damage bonuses now have diminishing returns when using Syntheseps, and Melee and Glaive Melee damage bonuses now have diminishing returns when using Worm God's Caress. And for Frenzied Blade, they reduce the forward offset melee lunge target point. And that about does it for the changes coming to the subclasses in the final shape. Next up, we have Weapon Tuning. 
Now, I will be honest, a lot of this is numbers, so I'm going to summarize it as best I can. But if you want all of the specifics, the full article will be linked below along with the other sources of information I use for this video. The team has increased base weapon damage almost universally, albeit with some exceptions for weapons that were either already overperforming or recently buffed. Therefore, all spec mods, aka boss spec, taken spec, minor spec, major spec, and adept big one spec are being retired. The following weapon archetypes are having their base PVE damage against all combatants increased. Pulse rifles, pellet and slug shotguns, fusion rifles, sniper rifles, glaive projectiles, linear fusion rifles, note. Certain exotics are exceptions to these changes due to their current performance or recent buffs from previous updates. Now, along with the base PVE damage increase, the following weapon archetypes have had their damage against minor and red bar enemies increased. Sidearms, trace rifles, bows, scout rifles, auto rifles, pulse rifles, submachine guns, and hand cannons. Trace rifles have also seen an increase in their damage against majors or orange bar enemies. Machine guns and swords have had a global damage increase, including in PvP. Splash damage from ag clear exotic primaries have been reduced by 10%. The following weapons are affected by this change. Sunshot, Polaris Lance, Trinity Ghoul, and Graviton Lance. Kinetic damage type weapons no longer deal bonus damage to bosses, though damage to other combatant tiers is unchanged. For example, a kinetic sniper rifle and a stasis sniper rifle of the same subfamily will both deal the same damage to a boss. The team has made some quality of life updates to several weapon types as well. The heavy, adaptive, and aggressive burst weapon intrinsic names have been updated to match the burst count across all weapon archetypes. Functionality remains unchanged. Two burst is now heavy burst and includes sidearms, hand cannons, and pulse rifles. Three burst is now adaptive burst and includes sidearms, linear fusion rifles, and adaptive pulse rifles. And four burst is now aggressive burst and only includes pulse rifles. The team has removed the foundry name from the vice rapid fire, hockey precision, and Omelon adaptive weapon intrinsics. Scout rifles have an updated hip fire reticle to better show accuracy and aim assist state. Now some aggressive frame hand cannons struggle to compete with the stats of top tier examples. <coughs> Igneous hammer. <coughs> uh, uh, something's caught in my throat there. <laughs> um, anyway, with Crimrose Dagger and something new returning in the final shape, their stats have been updated. Low inventory sniper rifles were a little too low in PvE, so the minimum reserves have been increased from 14 to 17, but maximum reserves are unchanged. Adaptive burst linear fusion rifles are strong, but can be a bit hard to control, so their firing animation kick and recoil have been reduced. Waveframe grenade launchers are seeing some blast radius changes. The size of the wave is now affected by the blast radius stat. The default display stat for blast radius has been changed from 100 to 50. Whereas 50 represents the previous baseline, any stat over 50 will result in a larger wave segment than what was possible before this change. Now, sadly, special ammo waveframe grenade launchers such as Forbearance have had the length of their wave reduced to address their overperformance as ad clear options in PvE, but Dead Messenger is an exemption to this change. Now, swords have had their reticle updated to better indicate the charge state, so when sword energy is consumed, the amount of delay the sword has before it begins to recharge now slightly appears in the reticle. There's also some bug fixes inbound for swords. The overwhelming battle song debuff from some missions will no longer prevent swords from recharging or losing energy while guarding. An unpowered caster sword heavy attacks will now reset the sword's energy recharge delay. An uncharged adaptive sword heavy attacks will no longer cost the same amount of ammo as their charged counterparts. They will now just cost one ammo, the same as any other uncharged heavy attacks. Now the following changes pertain to exotic weapons only. Rat King and Devil's Ruin are getting minor changes due to issues surrounding their firing animations. Gallarhorn's Wolfpack rounds have had their visuals updated to reflect the damage type of the weapon they're being fired from. And the following exotic weapons are receiving buffs. Touch of Malice, Necrochasm, Dead Man's Tail, The Colony, Queen Breaker, Truth, Cerberus Plus One, Bastion, Symmetry, Ariana's Vow, and Deterministic Chaos. Meanwhile, in addition to the exotic primaries we mentioned earlier, the following exotic weapons are also receiving nerfs. Osteostriga, Lament, and Divinity. Now the Fundamentals exotic perk where you can swap damage types on Borealis, Hardlight, and Dead Messenger now maintains its state across death or respawn. In other words, it won't reset the damage type you were using when you died. We will now quickly review some of the changes coming to perks. 
Alacrity will no longer work in Rumble. Archer's Gambit has reduced draw time and buff duration. Grave Robber will now activate on dealing damage with a powered melee in addition to standard melee kills. Chain Reaction on special weapons will have a smaller area of effect and do less damage, while on heavy weapons, the area of effect is the same and deals more damage. Edgy Current has a quicker activation time and provides some stat bonuses while active. Being Amplified will automatically trigger the perk at its maximum effectiveness. Underdog is being removed entirely for now, and weapons that still have it as a perk will see it replaced with Pulse Monitor. Osmosis and Permeability no longer drop off when pulling out your Ghost or performing similar interactions, and now partially refill the weapon's magazine on activation. The number of slow stacks applied with Chill Clip is now based on the properties of the weapon. Rapid Fire Fusion Rifles will take three shots, while slower firing fusions will only need two. High Ground has been reworked to provide a stacking damage bonus when getting kills in any context, or instantly granting the maximum amount of stacks when damaging an enemy from the high ground. Max bonus damage has been increased for PvE and PvP. Killing Tally on 21% Delirium has been updated to match its current version, and Deconstruct now refills from reserves instead of from thin air and should trigger more reliably across weapon types. Perks that match your equipped subclasses have also had the following changes. Osmosis and Tessellation now match the damage type of your equipped grenade, and Permeability and Elemental Capacitor now match the damage type of your equipped super. And that does it for weapon tuning. Next, we'll be going over changes to armor. Realizing that Prismatic fundamentally changes how Destiny works, the team had to take a look at existing armor and mods to see where they could find the balance. This meant, in some cases, only requiring a particular super to be equipped as opposed to a full subclass to get certain exotic armor benefits, while in other cases, better defining mods to account for the new ability kits. So, starting with Hunters, of course. Triton Vice no longer requires a glaive that matches your subclass to trigger its extra detonations. Glaive projectile final blows will now always trigger a detonation that matches the glaive's damage type, even when the glaive does not match the equipped subclass. Additionally, the surrounded effect provided by the Triton Vice while wielding a glaive now lingers on the player for 5 seconds after no longer being surrounded. Dragon Shadow will now trigger its effects when you use the ensnaring slam or the new ascension arc aspect. Foe Tracer now grants the bonus damage it inflicts on a target to weapons. The damage type also matches that of the ability used to damage the target instead of always matching your equipped subclass. The 6 Coyote, in addition to its current functionality, will now allow you to create orbs of power from final blows after using your class ability. It's basically a free copy of the benefits provided by the Reaper mod. Star Eater scales now require an increased amount of orbs of power to grant maximum benefits. The increased super energy gain per orb of power when Golden Gun is equipped has also been reduced. Now, moving on to Titans. Ursa Furiosa has been updated to improve the new Void aspect, Unbreakable, in addition to its previous effects. They also now provide increased movement speed while guarding with Unbreakable, and also grant super energy for guarding with Unbreakable. This energy scales based on the amount of incoming damage the shield absorbs. Eternal Warrior no longer requires an arc subclass for arc final blows to grant its escalating arc weapon damage bonus. Armamentarium, in addition to its current functionality, will now allow you to create orbs of power from grenade final blows. Again, free copy of the benefits provided by the Firepower mod. Kepri's Horn has increased potency for its Solar Blast. It does increase damage and will now apply Scorch anytime it hits a target instead of only applying Scorch once. This exotic also now benefits from the Ember of Eruption and Ember of Ashes fragments. Heart of Inmost Light's buffs will now display as a single consolidated status effect icon in the HUD to communicate its state instead of the 2-3 to three it used before. This exotic's functionality is unchanged. The Biotic Enhancement perk for Synthoseps has a reduced linger time after no longer being surrounded. This duration is now visible as a timer on the buff. And Severance Enclosure's explosions now require a line of sight to damage enemies. The knockback intensity of these explosions has also been reduced and will now launch enemies more consistently vertically. And my dear Warlocks, Mantle of Battle Harmony has been adjusted to grant more super energy depending on the target type killed, and the cooldown on granting super energy has been removed. Sacant Filaments' Empowering Rift will now reset a player's existing Devour buff duration when they enter it, in addition to its previous behavior. Verity's Brow will now require final blows with the weapon matching your grenade's damage type. 
The increased grenade recharge rate and solar grenade duration for sun bracers has been reduced. Sag. <laughs> and Cenotaph Mask can no longer trigger its effect using a single enemy target when used by multiple players. Cenotaph's target lock visual marker is also now hidden for the exotic wearers and only appears for the wearer's allies. Now, the team is also currently working on balancing changes to better address the ways certain subclass aspects can completely circumvent the cost of using a powered melee ability. The goal is to better assess how those changes can help with increasing the potency and utility of powered melees in the sandbox. For the final shape, Severance Enclosure and Assassin's Cow are being updated to only trigger their effects when a player spins a melee charge or uses a finisher to get a final blow, and similar changes will be rolled out in the future. Also, exotic armor will now be able to be upgraded after it has been fully masterworked, granting an artifice mod slot, which is chef's kiss. For those who don't know, an artifice mod slot is basically an additional mod slot added to a piece of armor, typically found on artifice armor that you get from like master raids and dungeons and things of that sort. At any rate, the cost of this upgrade is one exotic cipher and 10,000 glimmer. We also have some changes coming to ammo finder mods. Heavy and special ammo finder mods will now retain their progress towards generating an ammo brick even after the player's death. And this ensures players receive ammo more predictably, especially in harder difficulty activities. Thank you, because I'm gonna need that. Um, ammo finder mods will be disabled in the crucible. Player kills no longer grant ammo finder progress in Gambit, and due to these changes, kill requirements for special and heavy ammo finders are increased by 20% for Guardians and a fire team. A solo Guardian's kill requirements remain unchanged as they lack the teammates to resurrect them, which is fair. And finally, all mod energy costs have been removed from raid-specific armor mods, making it easier to integrate them into existing loadouts without disrupting build synergy. And that wraps up all armor tuning coming. Next, we'll be talking about a new system called Pathfinder. A Pathfinder consolidates bounties, patrols, and weekly vendor challenges into a single system that can be accessed at any time via the director, making it much easier to track and complete objectives. Pathfinder will present players with 20 objectives divided into five tiers, leading to a final reward. Players will need to complete and claim objectives to progress from one tier to the next. Rewards are given for each claimed objective, with the final reward becoming available upon completing a path. After claiming the final reward, players can reset the Pathfinder for a new set of objectives and a new final reward. Resetting Pathfinder costs Glimmer and involves both authorial control and procedural generation to ensure a variety of objectives. The value of the final reward diminishes with each reset, however, with every weekly reset, the value of the final rewards will also reset. Your objective progress will be lost and every guardian will start the week with the same fresh card. Now at launch, two Pathfinders will be available. One for all guardians, which will replace the bounty systems and weekly challenges for core activities, and one that will be unlocked in the Pale Heart as part of the campaign. So, the Rituals Pathfinder will include objectives spanning Vanguard Strikes, Nightfalls, Onslaught, Gambit, and Crucible. Some objectives are universal, while others will be tied to a specific ritual or mode. The Pale Heart Pathfinder will have objectives that would typically align with destination bounties and will also include new location-based objectives called field assignments. Field assignments will be marked on the map and can be tracked with waypoints. The purpose of Pathfinder was to unify the various pursuit systems in Destiny and empower players to choose their own objectives, providing more control over their individual gameplay goals. Pathfinder encourages strategic decision-making by linking objectives and rewards in a path-based system while simultaneously eliminating the need for frequent travel from vendor to vendor to vendor or using the Destiny app to manage bounties, thereby creating a more efficient method to progress and claim rewards. The twid from week before last goes into further detail on how the breakdown of rewards will look, and you can find a link to that full article in the description of this video. Now, we have one final section of this video to cover, and I do appreciate you taking the time to watch, especially if you've made it this far. Bungie is collaborating with Wizard of the Coast, and alongside the final shape, the Eververse will have a set of D&D-themed armor, along with other cosmetics available. The timing couldn't be more perfect as we prepare for this grand adventure. Also, the final shape's raid, Salvation's Edge, will be going live on Friday, June 7th. Contest mode will be enabled for 48 hours, and players will need to be at at least power level 1965 to be at cap for all encounters. 
to enter, at least the fire team leader must have completed the campaign and the wild card exotic quest in order to launch the raid. Now, it is recommended that all players intending on taking on the raid and entering the race complete these requirements as the raid itself does contain spoilers. So, in other words, make sure you get all that done if you plan on jumping into the raid on Friday. Fire teams will no longer be required to go to orbit in order to complete the race. The first team to finish every encounter and loot the final chest will be declared world's first. Bungie will be carefully reviewing analytics before announcing the winners. But alas, we have made it to the end, my friends. And the next time you hear from me in this medium, we will be well into the fight of our lives. The final shape goes live on Tuesday, June 4th. And as of recording, editing this video and getting it out to you all that's tomorrow it's probably already live now but um i will see you all in the pale heart but until then if you've enjoyed this video or found it helpful in any way please do me a solid and again give it a thumbs up it might seem like a little bit but it does go a long way in terms of helping the channel grow and if you want to see more content like this you know you want to keep up with my journey into the final shape our journey into the final shape be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. My name is Lost Angel of Havoc. Thank you so much for watching Late Tato Clips. We will see you next time, friends. Same late time, same late channel.